Good morning. Welcome to Pentecost Sunday at Lakeshore. Pentecost is another of the high holy days of the Christian calendar. Called by many the birthday of the church, Pentecost represents a sort of a passing of the peace of the man, mantle of, of sorts from the incarnate Christ to the ever present spirit, passing the mantle from the incarnate Christ here on earth to the ever present spirit. The reminder of the God within, our sustainer, our guide, our encourager, our strengthener. Pentecost is a day of celebration for all that, for all that God has done and is doing within the life of the church. We are so fortunate today to have Amy Butler, part of our extended family, uh, with us today to preach. She preached for us twice during Lent and. Now that we're on the other side of Easter, she's pre preaching for Pentecost. And I was thinking this morning, it seems um, like a natural for Amy to preach for us this day because she is a person who has lived in many of the major cities uh, around our world. Amy was born in Hawaii. Uh, she has lived in Richelieu, Switzerland, in Prague, Czech Republic, in New Orleans, New York, Washington, D.C., and Waco, Texas. And we are glad that she is joining us from Washington, D.C. this morning, where she is um, the interim senior minister at National City Church there in the nation's capital. Thank you, Amy, for joining us. And I also want to introduce you to someone I've not known all that long, like I've known Amy for a long time. Um, we want to introduce uh, Jack Rep Repovich. Um, Jack, there's Jack. Uh, Jack is a PhD student in math at Baylor. He is going to graduate in August, and he has been worshiping with Lakeshore through Zoom these last few weeks and months. We've talked several times on the phone and several times by email, and I wanted to tell you a little bit what about what Jack said. He said, the environment at Lakeshore is so welcoming, and I truly feel God's love and the love of the church, even through Zoom. He said, one of the things I've learned from the faith community at Lakeshore and the one that drew me here the most is the view that we should love all because God's love knows no bounds. That is not our job to judge. We are all trying our best with what we have, and it is our job to care for one another and spread the joy and love that God has for us to others. So we do welcome uh, Jack to our Lakeshore membership, our Lakeshore family. And uh, Jack, right now we're going to uh, read you a traditional affirmation of welcome that Lakeshore offers its new members. So listen to this Lakeshore family. Lakeshore family, would you join me? We affirm you in your decision and celebrate oh, no. your place as a family. We accept, we accept our, responsibility our responsibility to help you grow in the form of Christ. We offer ourselves to be your family. God's child and, and indeed we do. You heard some voices of Lakeshore. You will learn to recognize other voices at Lakeshore. And now I offer each of you the chance to pass the peace of Christ to one another, to Amy, to Jack, and to everyone uh, watching us through Zoom today. May the peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. Also with you. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace be with you all. Peace of Christ, Bill. Peace be with you all. Welcome, Jack. Thanks of Christ. Peace 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 of Christ. Good to have you, Amy. Hello, Rufus. Looking forward to the party. The peace of Christ. Hello, Christ, and Marty. And you, Sarah, the peace of Christ. Thanks. Welcome, thank you, thank you, and Don. The peace of Christ with you. Peace of Christ, Sandy. Peace of Christ, John DeVries.
Peace, Milo. Uh, Spirit of God, wind of God, oh, fire of God, make known your presence, your work, work your justice, and your and love real to the world through us. Here we are, your church on a mission, your hands and feet in the world, set our hearts on fire. Join me in prayer on this Pentecost Sunday. Let us pray together. Holy God and Holy Spirit, send the wind and flame of your transforming life to lift up the church this day. Give us the wisdom and faith that we may know the great hope to which we are called. Spirit of truth, set us free to emerge as the children of God. Open our ears that we may hear the weeping of the world. Open the horizons of our mind by the flame of your wisdom. Loosen our tongues to show your praise, for only in your spirit can we voice your words of peace and acclaim Jesus as Savior. Open our mouths that we may be a voice for the voiceless. Open our eyes that we may see your vision of peace and justice. Make us alive with the courage and faith of your prophetic truth. Spirit of unity, reconcile your people. Give us the wisdom to hold to what we need to be your church. Give us the grace to lay down those things that you can do without. Give us a vision of your breadth and length and height to challenge our smallness of heart and bring us humbly together. Holy Spirit, Lord and Comforter, Spirit of truth everywhere, filling all that exists, treasury of good gifts and source of life, come and dwell in us. Cleanse us from all sin, and in your love, bring us to salvation. Amen. We now sing together, Let Every Christian Pray. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Явились им разделяющиеся языки, как бы огненные, и почили по одному на каждом из них. A przebywali w Jerozolimie Żydzi, mężowie nabożni, 
spośród wszystkich ludów, jakie są pod niebem. Als nun dieses Brausen geschah, kam die Menge zusammen und wurde verstört, denn ein jeder hörte sie in seiner eigenen Sprache reden. Desconcertados y maravillados decían, ¿no son Galileos todos estos que están hablando? Kuinka me sitten kuulemme kukin oman synnyin maamme kieltä? Kita orang Parsia, Media, Elam, penduduk Mesopotamia, Judea dan Kapadokia, Pontus dan Asia. Frigia, na Pamphylia, Misri, na Pande za Libya, karibu na Krene, na wageni watokao Rumi, wa Yahudi na waongofu. Kiritiyuna wa Arab, na smahum yatakallamuna bi alsinatina bi adhaim Allah. Todos atónitos y perplexos preguntaban unos a los otros, ¿o qué será que eso quiere decir? En adrir hubo a spotte o sodo, folkid el drukkid af saitu vini. Ekkor előállt Péter a tizeneggyel, felemelte a hangját, és így szólt hozzájuk. Zsidó férfiak és Jeruzsálem minden lakója, figyeljetek szavaimra, és tudjátok meg, Mit jelent mindez? Ai muta nennen babuga gubani yadda kuke zato. Tunda yake yanzu karfe tare ne na safi kawai. Mais ici se réalise cette parole du prophète Joël. Ito ang gagawin ko sa mga huling araw. Sabi ng Diyos, ipagkakaloob ko ang aking espiritu sa lahat ng tao. Ipahahayag ng inyong mga anak na lalaki at babae ang aking mensahe. Ang inyong mga kabataang lalaki ay makakakita ng mga pangitain at ang inyong matatandang lalaki ay magkakaroon ng mga panaginip. Heno, no kumbada o vapia vange o vapimeno no vakain mo. Mahanjitirile ko o mepo yo mo mepo yange o mo mafikuye niya. Derevo o tabakakunganika. அல்லாமலும் உயர வானத்திலே அற்புதங்களையும் தாள பூமியிலே ரத்தம் அக்கினி புகைக்காடாகிய அதிசயங்களையும் காட்டுவேன் So much so, I had to get balloons. You see, today is the birthday of the church. On Pentecost Sunday, we like to dress up in red because we are told in our holy scriptures that this is the day the Holy Spirit came upon us. In our scripture today, you heard us talk about how flames came upon the disciples and those who heard the words of Jesus. And what we do on this day is celebrate the birth of the church. And that's why I had to get some happy birthday balloons. Today we're going to be able to celebrate all the things that make the church so wonderful. And that's community, that's people, that's family, that's friends. You see, God calls us to be supportive of one another, to love one another, and to walk beside each other. And a lot like whenever we get together and celebrate birthdays, we're doing the same thing with the church as a whole. Now, church as a whole means not just Lakeshore. That means every single body of people who gather together to celebrate what it means to be a Christian. This afternoon, we're going to be gathered together eating ice cream and playing games. One, because we're super excited to be in a time work in COVID that we're able to be together. And two, to celebrate the birthday of the church. Our holy scriptures tell us that on this day, hundreds of thousands of years ago, Christians heard the message of Jesus, 
heard that Jesus came and lived a life of love, a life of compassion, and that we too, as the church, are supposed to live that out in our world and in our church family. Join us this afternoon as we celebrate. I'll be bringing my balloons, and we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship celebrating the birthday of the church. I'm so glad to be able to share this time with you, and I look forward to having fun this afternoon. And remember, on this day, we are celebrating all the good things of what it means to be a family, what it means to follow after the life and love of Jesus, and I hope you continue to live that out in your daily life too. Let's pray. Our God, we are so grateful for the ways that you teach us how to live, to love, and to laugh. We're grateful for the people that you've put in our lives, family and friends, church family and friends. May we continue to celebrate all the great things that make our church a church and celebrate the ways that different types of Christian all around the world celebrate that same thing today. Happy birthday to our church. Thank you for giving us this message and may we continue to have fun and learn from one another. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Spirit come down like the days of old. Spirit come down and fill my soul. Lord, I want to be used by you to feel your power in all I do. Spirit come down and fill my soul. the day of Pentecost, the disciples of the Lord were in one place, when suddenly from heaven on high came the wash of a mighty wind, that mighty wind then filled the place, and the Spirit appeared like tongues of fire, it took control of everyone, filling them with power. Come down like the days of old. Spirit, come down and fill my soul. Lord, I want to be used by you to feel your power in all I do. Spirit, come down and fill my soul. People there from every land, yet they heard God's word in their native tongue. For the Spirit had helped them understand the mighty word of the Lord. Spirit, come down like the days of old. Spirit, come down and fill my soul. Let's pray together. Breath of God, your breath of life fills the whole world and holds all things together. If you withdraw your breath, everything turns to dust. You are the source of life that Jesus promised us. 
your wholeness, fullness, presence. And even in your mystery, unknowable and eternal, you are our guardian right beside us each step of our lives. Holy Spirit, wild word on this day of Pentecost. We are gathered alternately full of fire and fizzling embers, courageous and tentative, gifted by dreams and some days haunted by worries. Come Holy Spirit, we are here with trembling hands and uncertain hearts, but we want to walk with you, show us your way. Breathe your spirit on us as you did on those believers so long ago. In this past uncertain year through which we have come, we need to feel your spirit again and remember your intention for abundant life. The mission of your spirit is a movement for life and healing to which you invite us. Help us join with you in comforting the weary, the lonely, the sad. Help us love each other with our deep expressions of your everlasting love. Blow away our fears and hesitations. Replace them with passion and energy to live your story in the world. Will you declare again the assurance we long to hear that all your children on this earth are worthy of your peace and your sons and daughters of every land and language may prophesy and dream dreams? Give us resilience to pick up the gifts we set down for a while. We ask you now to renew our passion, renew our spirits, renew our calls to serve you. Fill us with visions beyond our wildest dreams, encouraged to live into them, guided by the encouragement of your spirit. Spirit of God, breath of life, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Morning, everyone. It's really lovely to be back together with you. Um, thank you for the invitation to be back today on what is one of my favorite, favorite Sundays of the church year. So happy Pentecost to everyone. And um, I'd like to share with you a reading from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I've long thought that it, it's an utter shame that there's no guide to the emotive content of our Bibles. There are, as all of you know, all different kinds of Bibles, like the Women's Study Bible, the um, New Women's Study Bible, the Archaeology Study Bible, the Action Hero Bible, the Johnny Cash Bible, I'm not lying about that one, the Bible for Dummies. It's completely plausible that someone could undertake a project called the emotional Bible or something like that. Why? Well, I think it would be helpful to know that Jesus says certain things sarcastically or with exasperation or that he smiled uh, as he rebuked them so they knew it was a joke or he rolled his eyes when the Pharisees started giving him a hard time again or the disciples were sad or they spoke with urgency. 
you know, like emotive qualifiers like that. I just think our experiences of reading the Bible would be so much richer if we had that insight. Alas, we're just going to have to wait and ask the gang what they really felt later. In the meantime, it is up to us to best try to understand on an emotional level what the first disciples were feeling as they lived through those action-packed days following Jesus' resurrection. An emotive guide would be especially helpful, I think, this week, when a quick reading of the text for today will tell us what was happening on the day of Pentecost was no regular run-of-the-mill experience. Emotions, you know, must have been running at their highest. You can suppose from the very start of the chapter, when the relief in Luke, the writer's voice is almost audible to us 2,000 years later. He begins the second chapter of the book of Acts, when the day of Pentecost had come, which sounds to my ears like when the day of Pentecost had finally come, he said with utter relief in his voice, right? The Greek word here for come means something like fulfilled or realized. And Luke was saying that what they had been waiting for was finally here. After all this time, after running around after Jesus, trying to keep up with him and understand what he was saying, after living through hell and horror and crucifixion, after standing there wide-eyed last week as he drifted up into the heavens, after all of it, the day of Pentecost was finally here. Jesus told them they would receive help from on high and they were waiting. Surely the day of Pentecost would be the time when whatever help Jesus mentioned, maybe he was coming back, would arrive to fix everything and to get them out of the upper room once and for all. The disciples were gathered again in that room, the text says. They were ready for the celebration of the festival of weeks, Shavuot. Shavuot is an important Jewish festival that commemorates the time when the first fruits are harvested and brought to the temple. But from a religious perspective, the festival celebrates the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. In other words, it's a festival for the giving of life, fruits from the earth, to sustain us and guidelines from heaven by which we order our lives. Shavuot is celebrated seven full weeks after Passover, so we have some sense of the time frame in which the disciples are functioning. All of this, all of the stories we read, the appearances of Jesus, the shock of the empty tomb, the surging hope of his post-resurrection appearances, the grief and confusion of him leaving again, all of this had happened in the seven weeks since the last time they'd gathered in that room to celebrate a significant Jewish feast, remember? It seemed like yesterday to them that they gathered in the room to celebrate the Passover meal the night it all began, and here they were again gathered for another festival of their faith, waiting for Jesus's promise to unfold, not sure of what was going to happen next, but sure that it was going to be something important, something that was going to come and help them to answer their questions, to set things right once and for all. (laughs) It's a wonder that they hadn't learned by then. It is a wonder that we haven't learned by now that God is not a God of easy answers or convenient fixes. Instead, when God blows into our lives, into our world, things get a little bit unsettled. They're changing all the time. They are always shifting with the gusts of God's spirit. And we can't follow the spirit while we're locked away in our safe little rooms, clinging to tradition and life as we know it. We're called to Get out there and chase the spirit to follow the call of God to whichever strange places it might take us. I don't know what you think of when you think of the Sahara Desert, but my mind goes to extreme heat and mind numbing monotony, sand dune after sand dune, as far as your eye can see. It's huge. The Sahara Desert stretches 1,200 miles from the Mediterranean Ocean into Central Africa. 
Recently, a National Geographic NPR radio program called Radio Expeditions produced a series on desert life in the Sahara. The reporter, whose name was Alex Chadwick, was traveling from Timbuktu following a camel caravan through the desert along the same route that they've traveled for over a thousand years to the great salt mines of Mali. So the caravan came upon a village in the middle of the desert, a village named Arrowain. So Arrowain was built on low land, like a bowl in the desert to provide some protection from the winds that are always blowing and shifting the sand. All that stands in that tiny little village are a few single story mud buildings, a mosque and a well. Mr. Chadwick interviewed an old woman who had lived in Arrowain all her life, as had her family for many generations. She'd never left her village her whole entire life. He asked her about the winds, which blew sand constantly all over the house. She said that every day she got up and everything looked completely different. And she went out to try to shovel the Sahara away. And day after day, week in and week out, caravans made their way over that terrain, clearing a path that would only be covered up again whenever the wind decided to blow. A landscape at the mercy of the sand and the wind reformatting everything constantly. Every single day, the landscape looks completely different because the minute the winds start, everything changes. What a strange situation the blowing of the wind creates. For us humans bent on assimilation and institution, it is downright disconcerting to live in a situation where things are changing all the time. And this image of wind blowing is not the first image I would associate with the institution of the church. This place and experience that becomes a fixture in so many of our lives, a place that serves as a backdrop for our memories and a refuge during the times that life leaves us battered. In fact, it seems utterly bizarre to me that today, on the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, this great institution in which we've come to understand and express our faith, we hear a story about wind shifting, changing, blowing everything we expect into a completely different form and leaving us gazing out over a completely different landscape. If we feel rattled about the blowing of God's spirit, can you imagine how those disciples must have felt? There they sat, no doubt going over and over in their minds again, the events of the last few weeks. And the text says there was a sound like a rushing wind, violent, and it filled the entire house. And there was nothing staid or normal about any of that. A few years ago, I took a trip to Lynchburg, Virginia, to speak at a gathering of about 600 Virginia Baptist pastors. I was there to speak on a panel about revitalizing the modern church, to explore with other pastors and church leaders how we might do church in such a way that it's vital and relevant for this modern age. Of course, this is a topic that all of us church professionals love to explore. We long for a prescription or an idea, like a formula or a structure that will make the church, this institution that we love, alive and well in a society that increasingly disregards its relevance. So for three two hour panel sessions, I sat up front with two other pastors and fielded questions from the crowd. What should we do, many ask, about the burning question of whether or not to install a screen in the front of the church? How should I handle the uproar over the use of drums in worship? What kind of building should we build to attract new members? Well, I have the answers to these questions, and believe me, if I did, I wouldn't have been spending my weekend in Lynchburg, Virginia, telling my secrets to 600 Baptist pastors who could just as easily purchase my slickly packaged program for church success, right? 
in response to the increasingly frustrated questions from the audience asking for a plan or a formula or a fail-safe strategy, one of the other pastors on the panel told the story about how his church does its ministry. He called it a ministry of chaos. So looking out over those pastors, you could see the horror in their faces. He explained that anybody in their church who feels God's direction leading them to try something new gets to try it, like a new kind of ministry in the church or in the community. The community empowers that person to give it a try. Sometimes, he told us, the ideas take off, like a basketball league for at-risk youth, which has now become one of the biggest sports programs in town and has radically reduced the gang problem in the city. And sometimes ideas don't work well, like the midday worship service that nobody attended because there aren't enough people working in the immediate neighborhood of the church, right? When ideas take off, he said, the church runs with them. When they don't, the church stops them and tries something else. It's always changing. It's ever fluid. It's a ministry of chaos. So I was sitting there trying to imagine going to my church council and proposing my next harebrained idea, a ministry of chaos, all the while reflecting internally how hard it is for us humans who push and push and push to institutionalize our ideas, our faith, how hard it is for us to live with an idea like a ministry of chaos. One pastor in the audience got up and said that, well, he appreciated what the pastor had to say. He couldn't imagine how a ministry of chaos would work at his church. He explained, life is so chaotic anyway. Our society moves at such a mind-numbing pace, asking us to change constantly, to learn new things, to adjust all the time. How? How could he possibly ask his people to allow their church that one hour of refuge and stability in their other wise shifting lives to change? And the pastor who told that story on the panel looked straight at that man and he said, how could you not? How could you not? The disciples learned an important lesson the day when God's spirit blew in. They learned that God is never static. God is not an endeavor we can easily explain or expect. In fact, just when we think we've got God figured out, the wind of God's spirit blows in and changes the entire landscape of our relationship with God, then takes us to places we would never expect, not in a million years. This is hard for us. It is hard for us who like stability and institution. It's hard for us who like to know what's coming next and how to predict the next best steps. It's hard for us who build buildings and plan programs and want so hard to know God in a way that provides comfort and answers and situations we can predict. But this is not the God we follow. The God we follow blows into our lives and turns them on their heads, changing everything we expected and landing us in places we never thought we'd be. And this is the challenge before us today on Pentecost. Will we hear the wind of God's spirit blowing through our lives, through our church, and go and follow? We're here because people of faith who came before us had the courage to chase the wind of God's spirit wherever it led them. So today it's our invitation to gather the courage to chase that ever-changing wind of God's spirit as God leads us to whatever's next. Amen. So um, many of you know I had the privilege of being the, the pastor at um, 
the Riverside Church in the city of New York for five years. And there was a very common part of uh, one of Bill Coffin's benedictions that um, they loved to hear. And so I will share this with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Amen and amen, Amy. I jotted down several things that, that you said, especially about trying to sweep the Sahara out the door back into the Sahara again. Sometimes we have the Sahara coming right in our door. And these folks at Lakeshore are going to un understand, and you need to hear this too, that we have an ice cream social planned this afternoon from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. And several people on, on this Zoom meeting have been checking um, the weather predictions through the afternoon. It's going to be rainy, but we have not just so you all know, we've not made a decision yet with Heritage Creamery on Ice Cream Social, Great Pentecost Party um, in the rain. The chaos uh, may ensue at that point if we if we do that. But I wanted everybody to know you will get a, an email uh, this afternoon, probably on the email that uh, Steve sends about with the YouTube video of the service today and the newsletter prayer concerns. Uh, also want to let you know that we're about to have a church business meeting. Um, it will, there will be reports from the stewardship committee and the finance committee. So if you want to take a break after the congregational benediction and the post salute for about five minutes and then just leave your camera on um, right there and, and come right back to the Zoom meeting. Amy, thank you so much for being here today. We ask you for Pentecost. After we had said we're going to invite you uh, on a Wednesday night just to visit with us about what, what you're doing in D.C., we're still going to do that, okay? So you'll hear from me again. Okay, thank you for being with us on Pentecost Sunday. We'll remember this day.